recording. on your parachute. So it, it actually is pretty good right now. <laughs> Hello, Sloanies. Greetings from New York. My name is Asha Arvindakshan, Sloan Fellow, MBA Class of 2017, and an events leader for the MIT Sloan Club of New York. Today's session will run close to an hour between the panel's discussion and your questions. As a reminder, you are on mute and your video is turned off and you can use the Q&A button in the menu at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask questions during the session. Within a week, all registered guests will receive an email from the MIT Sloan Club of New York with the recording. As folks are trickling in, why don't you share in the chat which part of the world you're listening in from today? I'll drop mine into the chat right now. Our webinar is called Beam Me Up Sloaney, the Future of Space Innovation, and it is part of the annual MIT Space Week events. Currently, we're streaming live into the Space Tech Conference organized by the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. The week wraps up with the new Space Age Conference organized by the Sloan Astropreneurship and Space Industry Club. I'd like to thank Dr. Lit Richard Linares, Joyce Light, and Anish Kare for partnering with us on the marketing of this webinar. Panelist. As a reminder, we're joined by over 100 MIT and MIT Sloan alumni and students from all around the world. They work for Fortune 1000 companies, family businesses, and their own startups. Sloan's mission is to develop us into principled, innovative leaders who improve the world and generate ideas that advance management practice. And in that vein, we host today's webinar to raise the awareness of the trends in space technology. Now, I'm thrilled to welcome our distinguished panel to speak with our Sloan alumni and friends. Let's meet today's moderator, George Lordos. Six years ago, I met George in the Graduate Student Leadership Initiative, which brought together students from different parts of the Institute to learn from each other. George ran a successful business in Cyprus and returned to MIT for his PhD to study how humans could live sustainably on Mars. I was so impressed. Since we first met, George has founded the MIT Space Resources Workshop, led the design and prototyping of multiple award-winning space technology concepts, and deepened his knowledge of the industrial ecology of human settlements on the moon and Mars. George is a two-time MIT alum, now completing his PhD in the Aero Astro Department. George is joining us from on campus in Cambridge today. I'll keep an eye on the Q&A and we'll get to the audience questions in the second half hour. Over to you, George. Thank you very much, uh, Asha, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, so welcome, everyone. We're uh, thrilled to have you with us. And uh, we have a, like, a very exciting conversation with our panelists today. Um, so please allow me to introduce uh, our distinguished panel. Um, Dr. Farah Alibe is a systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and an alum of our MIT Aeroastro Department, where she earned her PhD in aerospace engineering in 2013. Her previous education was in aerospace and aerothermal engineering from the University of Cambridge. Farah has worked on several Mars missions, including the Perseverance rover, which landed on Mars in February of 2021, and the Ingenuity helicopter, which performed the first powered flight on another planet in April 20, 2021. She also worked on the Inside Mars lander and its companion miss mission, the Marco CubeSats. Dr. Alibe is now the lead flight systems engineer, uh, flight system systems engineer for the Sphere X telescope, which will help us understand the beginnings of our universe. Jen Kostetic is the director of early stage partnerships for NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate and an alum of MIT's Technology and Policy Program, where she received her master's degree in 2007. Previously, she received a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Florida. In her current role, Jen has awarded more than 300 million in funding annually through SBIR, STTR research grants, through internal innovation projects, advanced concept studies, and technology transfer. She also currently serves as co-chair of the Partnership for Public Service Innovation Council. Previously, she has served in the NASA headquarters as Assistant Director for Open Innovation at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She has published numerous writings on innovation, including in the MIT Press, in Space Policy Journal, the New Space Journal, and Issues in Science and Technology. Patrick Zaituni is the Head of Space Mobility at Blue Origin and an alum of the MIT Sloan School, 
where he earned his MBA in 2007. His previous education was in astronautics and electrical engineering at the University of Southern California and Georgia Tech. He is responsible for programs for in-space transportation and logistics systems. Previously, also at Blue, Patrick helped create and led the Advanced Development Programs Business Unit, and he also led the national team to win the NASA's Artemis Phase One code. He was previously a partner at McKinsey & Company Aerospace Practice, serving NASA, the Department of Defense, and most aerospace primes and major suppliers. He supported these institutions across a variety of strategy operations and product development engagements. He also has previous experience with TRW and Northrop Grumman, where he led several activities within military and human spaceflight programs. So, uh, dear listeners, we have a, a very experienced and distinguished panel today, uh, spanning industry, uh, academia, um, space agencies, and, uh, and technology development. So, um, you know, Jen and Patrick and, and Farah, so you work for uh, NASA, Blue Origin, and JPL. Do you stop from time to time to imagine this wonderful uh, space future that you're helping to build or, or are you far too busy building it? I, I don't wanna to speak to everyone, but I think most of us you know, are in this business because of how much we love what we do, right? And, and I think it's, you know, the day to day, like everyone can be painful sometimes, right? We all, uh, we all have those days, but at least in, in my case, I do, I, I mean, when you're knee deep in Mars time and sleeping at weird hours, you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> um, so I think that's, that's the fuel that keeps me going, right? It's that passion. And, and that's kind of something that I feel like is a bit unique to our industry is you work with people who are just as passionate as you and who do these things for the advancement of humanity, for the advancement of understanding our place in, uh, in, you know, the nor in the earth system and in the solar system and the universe. So um, yeah, I think that's, it's, uh, at least in my case, it's my source of energy. Um, I, I'm, I'm just to add to what uh, Farah said, um, I also share the same, same feeling where um, it's very exciting, but it can also sometimes be all consuming. And so, you know, you're in the day to day, you're in meetings, you're talking to suppliers, you're trying to think, get things to work. It's, it's easy to be kind of be consumed by the little things and, and sort of miss the big things. Um, but I find a couple of things happening to me. One is sort of organically from time to time, you'll sort of be, you know, trying to solve an issue or, or, or you're sort of knee deeping in something and you, you just sort of like just pause and you're like, you know, we're not talking about making diapers or, you know, something very small here. Like, you know, the thing we're debating is like, you know, a solar array doing this one thing in the sun or on this planet. And, and you just are like, wow, this is what I'm actually talking about and solving. And it's just, it's just, you, it's just immediately re-energizing. Those are kind of the little organic pieces, but I also find that um, I almost deliberately have to step back and I try to take time, you know, either during the day or after the day um, to re-energize and geek out more about this stuff because, um, uh, you know, whether it's reading a sci-fi book or, or just kind of walking around and, and, and sort of, you know, observers walking around by where all the hardware is, it's just incredibly re-energizing because you're like, yes, this is what we're working on here. And it's just, it, 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 it sort of just re-energizes you to kind of go, go on for the next day. Yeah, I completely agree with what both of them said. Um, I think I'll maybe offer a couple additional thoughts on um, the notion of kind of a continually trying to get perspective in the dailies. I think we also will discuss at some point if every day looks the same or if they look different. And, you know, it's easy to get kind of stuck in the dailies at some point. But um, and also, I think it's natural for scientists, technologists and engineers to get um, stuck in the technology to Patrick's point. Right. Like we want to debate debate a particular architecture, or a particular design of a particular technology. And it's um, sometimes the space industry in that way, regardless of whether you're at, if you're in the government, if you're in industry, if you're in academia, can feel like, someone said this to me maybe over a, a dozen years ago, and I feel like it's such an accurate analogy, like a self-licking ice cream cone. Like we just love ourselves and we love our stuff so much that we can't get enough of it. Um, and sometimes it's hard to pull ourselves out to see how everybody else is viewing the ice cream. Right. Um, also, in terms of how we kind of make our case for funding on the Hill, um, public support, you know, how we uh, communicate the benefits of space uh, beyond 
just the coolness <laughs> um, and the exploration um, uh, uh, compulsion associated with um, doing what we do in space. And so I think um, I certainly pinch myself, if not daily, weekly or monthly, I try to forcibly pinch myself to remember that we're in very, very cool uh, places, not just for where we're working and the jobs that we have today, but also the industry, the emerging industry that we're working in that has been around for quite a while, but the shape of it is very different today than it was when I was coming out of undergrad, which is one of the reasons why I didn't actually immediately enter the space industry. I might be a little different from the other two panelists from what I heard in their introductory remarks in that um, I studied aerospace engineering because I liked math. Math was hard and challenging. And I really liked math. And so what else would I study? Like it's very complicated other than mathematics, right? But I never really thought I'd work in space. Graduating in 2005, it wasn't like an industry I really thought I'd work in. I went into Homeland Security actually right after under, undergrad for a while. Um, and I didn't really get into like the visioning part of uh, space, the potential for space until I started working at NASA. And the chief technologist at the time who I was working for like basically gave me a sci-fi reading list and was like, Jen, you're 28 years old. You're gonna be working with all these folks that have been thinking about this their entire life. You need to speak their language. Um, and he gave me a reading list and I am now obsessed with sci-fi. It's the only thing I read, um, but it's kind of like a kid. Like I'm an adult taking in the, the, the kind of kid's level of delight and learning about kind of sci-fi um, uh, stories and narratives that really do pump a lot of uh, passion and uh, perspective into what I do every day. And so, but it wasn't like it was a, it was a paved course for me my whole life to work in space. I kind of pivoted there in my late twenties and I've been there ever since. And I don't anticipate myself going anywhere else, but, <laughs> but it wasn't a sure thing for me. Thank you. That's a very interesting perspectives from, from all three of you. Um, so, you know, speaking of uh, science fiction, I mean, uh, things have been happening, uh, you know, increasingly um, uh, lately that, that once were completely science fiction. I mean, all the activities that, uh, that we now have on Mars and around Mars, including a, a helicopter. Uh, no, Farah, I mean, you're, you're part of the team that developed and operates the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. And, uh, and last week, I think actually last week was the one year anniversary of, the, of this historic uh, first atmospheric flight on Mars, um, an achievement that has been described uh, really as a Wright, Wright Brothers moment uh, by the media. Um, so, you know, building on this, uh, what do you see, Farah, coming next in, in terms of you know, daring new robots to explore the surfaces of other worlds in, in our solar system. And yeah, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> I think one of the incredible things is that we don't have to think about what's next, right? Like we're already here. There's already incredible things under development, right? I think helicopter is an in indication of the things to come, right? We have Dragonfly that's going to go to Titan, but there's all of these other programs that are being proposed for the exploration of the moon or Mars or other places. And, and I think what's, what's incredible about the time that we're in in space exploration, and I'm sure you'll hear that theme, theme over and over again today as we talk, is we're kind of in the Renaissance time of, of space exploration where we dare to do slightly crazy things. And, and when it comes to my job, what I'm seeing even in you know, the time that I've been there is we're more, we're more open to doing those tech demo missions, to taking that little risk um, because we have a good base in what we're already doing to expand our abilities to explore, right? So um, I worked on the Marco CubeSats, which were the first interplanetary CubeSats. And, and back in 2014, 2015, when we built those, they were, you know, things that you used in universities, not things that you went to Mars with. And, and we showed that it can be done. And it's the same with this helicopter, right? There's parts that are from a cell phone and that's okay because we, we take that risk to demonstrate something new. Um, so I'm not even going to try and speculate what we'll do next because I, I know I'll be impressed. I know I'll be surprised. Um, there's just an incredible number of concepts out there. Uh, but what I can confidently say is that our ability to explore our solar system is going to, to keep to keep evolving and changing over the next 10, 20 years. I think we're, we're at the point where we realize that the technology we have only gets us so far in answering questions and understanding the world around us. And we need to push the envelope a little bit. Oh, yes. So, uh, you know, continuing your uh, thoughts about uh, risk and pushing the envelope versus uh, the, you know, the need to, uh, to have um, space missions succeed. 
uh, that, that tension will always be there. And, uh, and uh, you know, maybe this is something we can uh, uh, push a little bit further on and, and look into. So, so Jen, I've, uh, I've heard uh, NASA described as an organization that, uh, that likes to minimize the probability of mission failure, uh, at least certain agencies do within NASA. Um, and uh, that, that would be in contrast with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, uh, who is you know, quite famous for being very willing to tolerate a very large number of failures just to get that one high risk, high reward uh, home run. So where does your um, um, uh, department, the early stage innovation, uh, and, and where do your stakeholders in academia and industry, where do you all fit into this uh, NASA to DARPA spectrum of, uh, of co being conservative versus taking risks? Um, to, yeah, so to that's work. a great, great question. Um, the, the set of programs that I oversee within the Space Technology Mission Directorate include uh, programs that work with small businesses, like the Small Business Innovation Research Program and Small Business Tech Transfer Program, uh, as well as our Technology Transfer Program that spins out NASA inventions um, to uh, other applications or also space applications through licensing. Our prizes, challenges, and crowdsourcing, so all our open innovation activities. Um, our Space Tech Research Grants, so all of our grants to universities for technology development. Our Center Innovation Fund and our Early Career Initiative, which are two programs focused on our center workforce, so the people that work for NASA um, that are researchers and technologists and innovators, um, and also uh, the NIAC program, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concept Program. And I just have to um, uh, thank Farah for teeing me up for some good impact examples um, for some of the work that we've had within our programs. Um, so uh, Marco and the Ingenuity Helicopter were actually two NIAC concepts. Um, uh, that were funded early stage concepts that were funded through the NIAC program to kind of de-risk the, uh, the concept study portion. Uh, could it work, right? With NIAC, we actually, we seek to uh, ide identify breakthrough ideas that could change the possible. And we study those at phase one and at phase two, we have phase threes now that actually are larger dollar value awards that can in some instances take it to actually like a mission design. Um, uh, but Marco and Ingenuity were two, um, two ideas that we kind of de-risked uh, with NIAC investments years ago, um, but it goes beyond uh, NIAC. Uh, I, I will say that in the early stage innovation and research, uh, uh, or early stage innovation and partnerships portfolio for STMB, this really is the playground for ideas for NASA. Uh, the 300 and roughly 300 million that we fund annually throughout all of those programs go to low TRL, um, to mid TRL uh, type investments across pretty much any innovator community you could imagine, whether that's small businesses, universities, individual innovators, entrepreneurs. Uh, we have methods to engage anybody with space technology ideas. Um, and those also that are looking to develop those ideas, not just kind of from a research and development standpoint, like to kind of de-risk them and maybe take them from TRL one to TRL three, but also the folks that are looking to commercialize um, those technologies and understand what it takes to find product market fit. Uh, we do a lot in our SBIR program uh, and our tech transfer programs to really be commercialization focused and to try to help uh, uh, companies and small businesses that are um, trying to get that kind of uh, market penetration within NASA kind of address their last technical risks um, so that external investors may be willing, for example, to um, increase their investment in them once the technology is de-risked to a point where they're not having to carry that technology risk. We, we, we can um, address a number of different uh, types of risk within our portfolio, whether that uh, be research, early career or early stage research risk, or the kind of de-risking the technology side of things that is important to seeding a, a pipeline of future ventures. Um, we are the place to do risky research, risky ideas. Um, uh, that are powering the future of space technology, right? So we are focused on technology. There's a lot of other parts of the agency that are focused on science missions or human exploration missions. We try to develop those technologies that enable um, uh, even more innovative architectures and approaches to doing that science and to doing that human exploration in the future. But the partnerships with those, those mission destinations or the folks that have lower risk right, because they're executing on the actual missions is critical because if we're not influencing kind of that transition pipeline um, and what folks are thinking about baselining into future missions, uh, kind of changing their imaginations about what could be possible 
with future designs and future architectures, then um, we're not transitioning as much as we could be. But we're also not looking for 100% transition because then we wouldn't be risky enough, right? So uh, we are looking for both those breakthrough types of ideas, as well as enhancing capabilities, right? That have near term products uh, or near term customers and our, our products that can be uh, leveraged kind of more in the near term. We try to blend a combination of both of those because they're both important from a technology um, success perspective for NASA in partnering with industry. Great. Um, so, so Jen, I, I take from what you said, the, the, the fact that technologies have this enabling role for more science and, and more human exploration in space. And uh, I think we all agree that uh, if, if somehow it were possible to, to come and go from space, uh, just like we, we do it with airlines in the present day here on, on Earth, we could do a lot more science, a lot more human exploration. And um, yeah, so, so Patrick, in, in, on that vein, you know, in, in this panel and also among our, uh, our audience, we have uh, academics, we have business people, we have public sector officials. So, you know, what, uh, from your perspective, Patrick, as, as you're the head of space mobility at, at Blue Origin, what, what are the critical enabling technologies that we should be developing to make space mobility more airline-like? Or like flying from one airport to another. Yeah, no, I. Uh, it's a great question, and, and I. Um, I mean, I think of sort of the good parts of airline travel, right? The things that we want to emulate are, you know, um, affordability, reliability, and frequency. Hopefully, we're not replicating the, you know, middle seat in the back of Spirit Airlines experience. <laughs> but uh, so we think about, you know, the, uh, you know, we break it down, sort of the, you know, and again, I, I try to focus on the the effect that we're trying to achieve as opposed to purely the technology, which again is affordability, reliability, and, and frequency. Um, affordability, um, uh, we, you can sort of attack it in different ways. And um, one of the big ways that we have chosen to do it at Blue and others as well is around reusability. Same thing with an airline. When we go from Seattle to JFK, we don't just uh, you know throw the, uh, the, uh, the airplane in the East River when we're done or pieces of it all along the way. So we, you know, by actually having um, reusability, what we call you know, highly operational reusability. So the ability to turn that asset around with a very small number of people and turn that around quickly uh, is key. And that's how you can, you know, one way to um, bring the cost down. You know, the other part is um, by, uh, by thinking of ingenious ways to counter the space environment. The space environment is very cruel. You got vacuum, extreme temperatures, um, radiation, you got micrometeorites and, 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 and sort of other, other forms of debris there that um, are, are quite dangerous. There's a, there's a sort of a very expensive way to solve those problems. And there is a, um, you know, other sort of more nimble ways that, uh, that a whole lot of folks have come up with. So I think that, that helps you get to the affordability piece. Um, reliability is key as well. Um, uh, it's thankfully something we've done tremendous improvement in airlines, um, you know, on, on launch vehicles specifically, there's been a lot of work to get it um, to, uh, um, uh, to where, you know, the reliability it is now. But actually, I think there's some emergent threats that maybe we haven't thought about before um, that we need to address going forward. So one is cybersecurity. I mean, I mean as we become, have much more networked um, systems, and not sort of these sort of siloed comm channels and, and everything is sort of you know, data driven, I think the, the actual threat of cybersecurity is one that we need to address to, to have high reliability systems. And then in some ways we're victims of our own success, um, space debris. Um, as we launch more and more things to LEO in particular, um, you know, pretty soon if we don't start to manage it, it'll actually become impossible to even launch through LEO or operate in LEO but if we don't, if we don't take take more caution and care and that's going to be very important to get that right in order to get the reliability piece right um and the third piece which i think in some ways is almost the most important one um is around the frequency um if if we're only going to space very rarely or only a few times a year um uh, you don't get practice. Everything gets very expensive. You're standing armies of people. So actually by, by driving more frequency, it actually helps both reliability and affordability. 
because now you have so much data about your system. Um, you you amortize your fixed costs, and, and essentially you can drive your 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 uh, recurring costs much lower. And um, in, in in order to do that, it's sort of been very interesting. We've um, uh, we've had these kind of theoretical debates in space forever, right? If you go to single stage to orbit or reusable, is there enough demand? And 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 it's it's sort of almost like being stuck in two energy states, right? There's we're sort of at a local minimum that's optimal here, but you need to spend money to kind of develop these new systems and then reduce the price, hope that there's more demand and eventually get to this other energy state where you know you have 10 or 100x more demand and you're making more money even though you're charging less. And, um, and that's not an engineering problem. That's actually a business model and a financing one. So it's actually been sort of really interesting to see how... Um, one, people have showed up with money, whether investors or SPACs or others, and have actually forced, almost like brute force, the solution to this problem. And other folks where they said, well, I'm going to combine, um, uh, you know, a launch vehicle with, um, with Constellation programs. And so I'm going to act as my own demand driver. And now by doing that, I can actually fund sort of the ability to do this. So we've seen some very interesting sort of solutions, part of which is the technical. I actually think the technical was not the hardest part. It's the business and 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 money because you know no bucks no buck Rogers so it's it's sort of been very interesting to see how those things have all combined together to hopefully get us to a more of an airline model. Um, okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Yeah, I agree with you that uh, it's uh, it's this trifecta right of uh, affordability, reliability, and and frequency and and how they interact. Uh, um, it, it's a collective action problem, um, perhaps, that uh, once we solve it, uh, we, will, um, we will transition to a new uh, state where there is uh, uh, access to space for all these uh, wonderful things that are coming. So, um, Jen, I mean, if, uh, if um, in our audience we have an alumni, MIT alumni, we have MIT graduate students, uh, we may have people who have thoughts about starting a, a company in, 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 in the space uh, industry. So, you know, if, uh, if um, these um, members of our audience are uh, thinking of developing technologies with, with NASA support, um, are there some technology areas that you see as being more prioritized or of most interest to, to the Space Technology Mission Directorate in the coming years? So, um... Good question, and I want to encourage all of y'all to think about <laughs> getting involved in um, the growing commercial space economy, whether that's starting your own company or um, coming to work for us or coming to work for industry or academia. It's a really um, exciting place to be, so welcome. Um, uh, but the uh, I, I want to kind of answer this question with two from two perspectives. One is uh, how to get a sense of what content we're most interested in from the NASA side, right? From the funding that uh, from the NASA funding side. Um, and uh, second, uh, kind of some of the ways to think about if you're start thinking about starting your own company, um, some of the uh, business strategies that not necessarily folks think about straight off the bat uh, that may be useful uh, for you to um, uh, find some non-dilutive funding in order to um, pursue your uh, goals uh, related to your venture. So first on content, um, I'd like to draw your point your attention to two important documents. Um, the first is every year, the, pro, the NASA releases a small business innovation research, small business technology transfer solicitation, SBIR and STTR solicitation. It is like a gold mine for problem statements. There's 120, we call them subtopics in that solicitation every year. But those um, subtopics are written by the NASA centers, the science mission director at the human exploration or now the exploration systems division and the uh, space operations mission directorate and the aeronautics mission directorate, um, as well as the space technology mission directorate. All five mission directorates and all 10 centers contribute basically problem statements for the technology challenges that are important for them to solve within the next two to five years. So they're not 20 year challenges, right? They might be two to five year challenges, because that's the time window in which uh, SBIR funding levels might be able to make a real difference. So from a single solicitation that basically gives you a menu of technology challenges, there's not one more comprehensive than the SBIR and STTR solicitation annually that comes out of um, 
that comes out of NASA. It's also very interesting to look over time how those topic areas change. So how are the, are the, the needs consistent? Have we consistently had a need around uh, a particular type of uh, sensor capability that we're just, obviously we don't have the solutions we need yet, so it shows up every year in the solicitation? Or is the ball moving forward in particular areas? Like how are our topic areas that relate to AI and ML changing every year? How are our topic areas related to robotics changing? Like how is kind of the, the, the state of the art evolving over years? You've got like this longitudinal comparison of how problem statements have evolved over time, which I also think is fascinating from a content perspective. Um, that's particularly relevant to, to entrepreneurs because they're bite-sized problems that small businesses and entrepreneurs can take on. It's not business model innovation per se, it's technology innovation. Um, the other um, thing that I point you to is that the Space Technology Mission Directorate has just started to release what's going to be a series of envisioned future priorities that relate to um, key capability areas to enable the future NASA's future exploration goals. Uh, there are in four general categories, what it takes to go, land, live, and explore. And under go, we look at things like nuclear propulsion, um, uh, um, CFM, uh, advanced propulsion, but it's really looking at, uh, if we're, we're thinking longer term about the capabilities we're gonna need to do the big things that we're hearing from our customers, both on the NASA side and the commercial side, what are those technology capabilities that we're gonna need to develop? We've, we've gone through basically a two year process to articulate those. And the first one of those is now out on the street through an RFI, the GO RFI that talks about nuclear propulsion, CFM and advanced propulsion. We're looking for uh, input from the broader community about what you have to say about how we've articulated those priorities. Um, and we'll do an industry day also focused on that. Live will come next or uh, actually land, I think might come next. I'm not exactly sure what order they're gonna come in with live, land and explore, but the capabilities required to do all of those things will be released through a series of RFIs and industry days in the coming year. And it's an opportunity for folks to think about these things, to engage with us as we frame out where we might solicit proposals to help move the needle in the future, right? So it's an important place to engage if you're kind of thinking about influencing kind of future areas that NASA invests in terms of space technology. So those would be a couple like really good sources for understanding how NASA is thinking about content. Because George, it's not as simple to say like, we care you know, mostly about robotics. Like we care about a lot of technologies. There's a lot of challenges. There is no shortage of challenges <laughs> um, in the space industry. And so, um, and for the various types of objectives that we're trying to reach. So it is important to be able to dive into the nuances of where we see our problem, uh, with the specific problems for space applications to be. And it's about knowing where to look for those. Um, so uh, that's what I'll say on content. On the second point on business kind of things to, to, to know if you're a student trying to start a business. Um, I have seen a, a, an enormous amount of companies take advantage, um, really, really take advantage of the SBIR program uh, in developing the underlying technologies that are going to be necessary in order to um, deliver on the services or products that uh, they envision as being their long-term business model. The SBIR program, um, it does require you to apply. It's some paperwork, right? Uh, but we don't take your equity. And uh, it's a signal of the technical uh, merit of the idea, uh, as well as the potential for an asset customer. The other thing that's important about SBIRs that a lot of people don't know is that if you're a company that's won an SBIR, phase one, you don't even have to get a phase two, um, you're eligible for the special authority called phase three. Authority, a phase three award authority, which means any government agency anywhere, doesn't matter, it's not just NASA, this could be the DOD, this could be USDA, uh, you know, if you're interested in climate, any purchaser of your potential technology has the authority to sole source an award to you forever for that underlying technology. It doesn't have to be competed. They can sole source an award to you if you have a phase one to justify it as. In fact, I think, I think Blue Origin may have just acquired a long-term, long, like a long-time SBIR company that has a ton of phase three authority from the years that they were working with 
uh, SBIR. So from a merger and acquisition standpoint, the value of the company actually, when you have access to that government market for like direct awards, um, it's pretty huge. We've seen a lot of merger and acquisition activity. Redwire, Voyager Space, um, those companies have been, the majority of the companies that they're actually buying up are former SBIR invested companies. Um, so I would just say that there's a lot of discussion about venture and angel investing and where to go for your capital. And that's, that's important too. But depending on what type of business model you have and where you are in your maturity as a business, um, it may or may not be the best money for you to take at a certain point in time. Same thing for SBIR and SDTR. So I encourage folks to think about the variety and the diversity of funding sources that are out there and available as you're thinking about your kind of longer term approach to who you wanna do business with. And if you think you wanna do business with the government at any point, engaging through SBIR can be really good um, to add to your business strategy. So um, just a few thoughts on, you know, folks thinking about um, starting up their own businesses and how to work with the government in doing that. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much for uh, those thoughts. So, um, Patrick, just to continue on, uh, on a different aspect of this conversation, more in the personal decision of whether to jump into, you know, the space business. So, you know, Patrick, you're both a Sloan MBA and you're also an engineer. Um, what could you say to alumni who are not engineers, but who are, uh, you know, intrigued by the idea of working on or in space? Um, what kind of space careers do you foresee in the not so distant future for, for non-engineers, especially? Yeah, yeah no, it, that's a, it, um, I think one of the misconceptions, as you point out, is that you sort of have to be an engineer to kind of come work in space, right? And, and, and the reality is any, sp any space company, yes, has the engineers, but also has, you know, operations and production people, has procurement people, has strategy people, has, uh, you know, sales and business development folks, and has a variety of different leaders. Um, I mean, I'll actually point out, you know, as, as, as an engineer myself, I know I, I am sort of guilty of this at time. Um, engineers gravitate to the hardware, right? You know, we sort of say, oh, cool thing. I want to go design that, right? And if you actually take a step back and, you know, think of, you know, enterprise value and what problem you're trying to solve, I think actually in many cases, the problem you're trying to solve, you know, doesn't require necessarily the hardware or the hardware isn't the focus, the most important thing. I'll give an example of, um, uh, let's say, Earth observation, right? Everybody gravitates. It's like, well, let's talk about the satellite and the arrays and how the launches. That gets like 95% of the attention of the engineers. But the reality is the part that actually makes all the money and the part that actually solves the business problem is the data algorithms and the business insights, right? Is like, you know, are my crops getting watered enough? Is, uh, are, are, is there trees close to my power lines? Is there uh, somebody digging up next to my oil pipeline, right? And, um, you know, I know you'd, you'd struggle to get an engineer's attention to actually think about that side of it and actually create the right algorithms and try to tease out the right business insights. So I think that's why I think that the best teams in aerospace actually have non-engineers who sort of are very much thinking about the business impact and sort of melding them in with engineers to kind of bring, you know, think of a product and a product strategy and bring that to market. Um, and I'll say it again, you know, no, no bucks, no Buck Rogers to quote one of my favorite movies, the, the right stuff. Um, part of the reason we've seen such incredible advancements in space is because if you actually look at the amount of capital that's truly flowed into space over the last 10 years um, from both, you know, US government, but also from uh, a, a, a whole variety of different investment mechanisms, it's been incredible. And so folks that are actually able to bring that money in, tap a lot of investor sentiment and, and you know, direct it towards space and towards things in space that actually create value, I think is, is pretty incredible. So, uh, you know, kind of to kind of summarize, you can, you can be, you know, on the strategy side, on the product side, on the sales side, on the money side, on and just even just bringing together the right team. I mean, heck, if you're the smartest person in the room, you've you've built the wrong team, right? So actually, somebody who can kind of bring together the right engineers and 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 give them the right vector and create the right environment, I think, is essential. And so, serial entrepreneurs who maybe don't come from space would would be great to have. That's great. Yeah. Um... So, you know, in, in thinking about translating success um, on, on Earth to, to new ventures in space, uh, but, but we can also look back at other success in space so far, right? So 
Um, Farah, I mean, it's a really, it's a well-known statistic that nearly half of all missions to Mars uh, have failed, uh, you know, going back 50 years. But, but if we look at the last 20 years or so, both NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory have a, a perfect uh, track record on Mars uh, with um, all missions successful in the last 20 years. Uh, at the same time, there's been constant technological progress to show from one mission to the next, you know, with the Pathfinder rover, then the um, opportunity and spirit, and then curiosity and perseverance. So, you know, both progress, technological progress and uh, steady success in the last 20 years uh, when it comes to missions to Mars. So what's the secret of this success? Um, what, what can current students and future engineering, uh, aspiring engineering leaders and business leaders learn from this success? Yeah, I don't think there's a, a single answer, right? I think if we did, we could, <laughs> that'd be a game changer. But I think there's a, there's a lot of things that happen in the aerospace industry and, and you know, specifically that I've encountered in my job that might be um, a little unique and, and kind of part of that secret sauce, right? Um, so one is that we learn from each mission. And so of course, when you start off landing on Mars or trying to do something a little crazy, you're going to have failures. That's part of your learning process. That's part of understanding the Martian atmosphere or what it takes to land and, and, and things like that. So, so it's not surprising, right? That with any technology, you're gonna fail early and then with time do a little bit better. But I think there's things that are unique to the aerospace industry that could apply more broadly, right? One is, the concept of apprenticeship that, um, you know, it's not formal, but I was surprised, right, coming out of MIT with a PhD and, and going to get my first real job. And I was like, well, I'm not using anything that I've learned in the past however many years, because that's not what it's about, right? What you're learning in, in school and through your, your master's and PhD programs are, are ways to think and ways to learn and, and sort of the broad concepts. But when it comes to aerospace, you, you learn from the people around you, you learn from the people who have done this before, and then you bring in your own flavor to it. And I think aerospace does that very well, uh, meaning that when we have new engineers that are paired with mentors who, who have more experience, that put in roles where they, they can have ownership of, of pieces of the puzzle, um, but there's always kind of like an oversight, or oh, let me teach you this, or let me show you how you get past this gate review, right? And you do it one or two times and then you can hit the ground running. And, and that's, that's a very unique way of learning and teaching. And it's this kind of continual teaching. Um, and it comes with two things. And I think those two things are kind of key. One is because the industry is like that, you get a lot of lessons learned that are passed from one to another. And I'm not just saying like, oh yeah, don't mess up your units because you'll miss Mars because we all know about that story. But but there's deep rooted lessons learned that get passed from program to program or even across the board, right? And that I think as any companies grow, that process of formalizing the lessons learned and making sure that as people retire or move on, that you're capturing that information somewhere and, and making it available um, to, to the next team is really important. Um, so one of the things that we do at JPL, for example, is that we have design principles. And so those design principles are managed by senior systems engineers who have worked these missions, who have view, a view across missions, and that gives them tools to say, okay, well, you know, if I was going to build a perfect mission, this is sort of like the things that we've learned, right? Like go to this temperature, test this way, do that. Um, doesn't mean that we follow the design principles every single time that we build a mission, but at least if we're not going to follow them, we understand where that guidance came from, right? Why is it that this big mission did this particular test? And if I'm not doing it, then I can at least know who to go talk to and say, okay, I understand the risk that I'm taking. Um, so that formalizing of, of systems engineering is, um, has helped. The other, um, which is an aspect that I love about the aerospace industry and, and the work that I do is that it's very open. Um, you're, you have a lot of collaboration, but you also have a lot of reviews. You have a lot of oversight and people can think like, oh, oversight, how annoying. <laughs> like I have to prepare this review. I have to, you know, but it's not just formal reviews. It's peer reviews. It's sharing your work. It's having someone else look at it. It's that, it's that culture of having sort of an open book and, and being like, yeah, please come have a look at what I did here. Please help me, you know, let's do a, a peer review to validate this um, so that 
and, and I can't tell you how many times we've caught little things, right? Like, have you thought about this? Or where, where's that number come from? Um, and and all of us are, are asked to serve in those kind of review positions, but also have that open uh, mentality, which is um, which is refreshing because you're always sharing and, and always, um, you know, and, and you're always kind of, you, you know, when something launches that you're not the only one that's looked at that one parameter, right? So in a way it's like, well, if something goes wrong, at least someone else has thought about it too. Um, or at least it means that when you put something out there, you can put your full faith in it, that you've done your best. And that as an institution, you have put the best that you could put out there, right? Uh, but as to why we've been lucky for the past 20 years, I think there is a little bit of luck, right? I mean, everything has gone right and we're not going to deny, you know, it's maybe a five, 10% in there that just, there was the right weather on Mars that day. Or I remember when we landed Insight, the month before we landed Insight, there was a global dust storm on Mars, right? And I'm not sure that we would have been so successful with our entire mission if we had hit the global dust storm right when we landed. And some of it is you're at the mercy of unknowns and things that change and, and you have to accept that a little bit, which is difficult as an engineer sometimes. Um, so, and, and I'll finish with this is, is I think part of, you know, people might look at the success that we've had on Mars and say, well, you didn't try hard enough if you're not failing, right? And, and I would argue that that might be true in some cases. I think, um, I think JPL and NASA in general, we talked about this, right? Sort of balances that risk and reward. And, and we have missions that, um, that do the big science missions and, and that are low risk. And I would argue that we've done, we've done some hard stuff. Um, and, uh, but to people that say, well, you didn't try hard enough, you try landing on Mars and then come back to me, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so Farah, so I guess the next uh, giant leaps coming. I mean, obviously the you know one is uh, the first woman and the first person of color in on the moon, but but I think the next one after that would be the first manned mission to Mars. And uh, we do have a question from our audience, and the question is: Will we see a manned mission to Mars in the next twenty to thirty years? And will it be one way, given the complexities, or will we be bringing them back? So. Well, I can't speak to, you know, NASA's goals in, in human exploration since I work on the science side of things. I can tell you from a personal point of view that, I mean, we certainly are seeing an industry that is pushing towards uh, crude exploration of space, right? With the return to the moon and the obvious next step is Mars. Whether it will happen in the next 20, 30 years, I sure hope so. Um, but, um, and, and when it comes to um, whether it would be a one-way trip, I would be very surprised, right? I think I think every concept that has looked at going to Mars is working on that return leg. It's it's part of it's part of what we do, and I think it's part, the achievement would be somewhat tampered if we say, well, we don't really know how to launch from another planet, right? And we're already working on those technologies. Um, sample return is going to re require us to launch a rocket to bring back, you know, arguably much smaller, um, uh, much smaller. Uh, a much smaller mass back to Earth, but but I think that technology is in development. So so I would personally be very surprised if we if we settled for a one way trip. I think uh, I think we'll be able to figure it out. But again, that's my personal uh, my personal view on it. And, and so you're confident that that we are going to Mars with with humans in the next twenty or thirty years, or, or even less. I mean, what what is your take on that? my uh, for my personal take? Um, you know, thirty years. I if you. If you look at how much we've achieved in the past 30 years, I don't think it's inconceivable to say that we could get to Mars in the next 30. Whether I would bet my money on it, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but certainly yeah. what I can, what I would put money on is the fact that we're going to have an exciting 20 to 30 years in aerospace, right? Like if there's an industry that's going to go leaps and bounds, um, I mean, I've seen how much we've accomplished just since I joined the industry, right? 10 years ago and now, and now where we're at. And, and how the face of the industry has changed so much. Um, in, and so I can't, I can't even imagine how much we'll do in the next 20 years. Um, okay, so um, Patrick, um, what um, do you see as uh, you know, the possibilities for um, activities on the, on the moon? So near term, whether in the next five years or 10 years, can you give us a little bit of a, of a roadmap of what, what are some possibilities? Yeah, I mean, we can always try. The thing I can guarantee you is whatever I say will be wrong, but uh, we, can, we can sort of uh, uh, you know, consider what, what, what might be. I think 
Um, I think it is going to be sort of a very exciting medley of, of actually three things, uh, civil, commercial, and national security. I think um, you're going to see, you know, as NASA um, further refines its exploration plans, I think you're going to see, you know, not just the initial sort of human landings, I think you're going to start seeing the follow on human landings actually happen there. Um, I think you're going to see um, uh, a big push to actually start putting infrastructure around that human um, landing uh, 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 piece as well. So part of it is uh, some of the fission uh, surface power work that's actually coming out of uh, STMD, NASA STMD as well, which is, I think, very exciting because once you have, you know, nuclear power on the moon, now you can actually start doing uh, in situ resource utilization, you can actually start doing sort of industrial level amount of work to actually build habitats, extract things to refuel landers and whatnot. Um, but then I think you're also going to see some infrastructure being laid out around the moon. So communications relay, uh, sort of a GPS alternate, you know, for uh, uh, to do position navigation and timing around the moon. So as we drive around, the astronauts, you know, and, and, and uh, robotic rovers know what they, where they are. Um, I think you're going to see some exciting new missions on the um, backside of the moon, which I think are going to be very exciting. It's one of you know one of the few places in the solar system where um, we as humans don't interfere with it as as much. So I think it's going to be exciting to see how that gets deployed. Um, commercially, I think um, a lot of commercial companies, blue included, are going to you know sort of have their eye on how do we start building towards business cases that close on their own. I, I think those are going to be more like medium to long term. I think the shorter term is going to be around how do you provide services that normally we'd have expected the government to provide? How do we provide them commercially as a service? So commercial com relay, commercial GPS, commercial things like that on the on the you know in and around the moon, which I think is going to be very interesting. Um, the national security angle is going to be, uh, I think, a question mark for me. Um, I don't. I think there's going to be extreme effort done to make sure sort of we establish the moon as kind of a peaceful place to conduct a lot of this activity. Um, but in order to maintain the peace, I think you need to understand who's out there and what everybody is doing. So I think you're going to see um, um, uh, interest and in just you know, from, from at least the national security side to understand you know, who's out there, what are all the different actors doing, and ensuring that um, no one's doing anything to kind of mess with the other folks. And, and so that we hopefully establish the same kind of norms and rules of behavior that we have here on earth that allow us to, you know, um, conduct things sort of in a joint fashion to essentially extend that um, rules and norms out to the, you know, to the lunar area as well. So I think it's going to be an exciting time after seeing so little activity around the moon, actually seeing so much of that happen at the same time. Great. Um, uh, so, all this activity that you're describing, uh, Patrick, um, is um, you know, uh, it I, I would con I would describe it as uh, the fruit of the of a very successful new mode of collaboration between uh, space agencies, especially NASA as the leading space agency on, on this planet, I would say, um, and and uh, and the private sector, um, and um, this. Um, is a transition that I guess began about 10 years ago or a little, little longer with a, a shift in focus of uh, NASA um, uh, seeking to, to buy services from the private sector. And, uh, and that has proven, I, I would say, uh, let me put it in the form of a question. Has, would we say that this has uh, proven to be successful and, and it's continuing to be extended? Um, most recently with the uh, free flyer space stations. Now NASA is calling for uh, private companies to, to, to put their own space stations in low earth orbit and make them profitable. Uh, and then NASA would be a tenant, I guess. So, you know, a question for, for either of, uh, for, for any of you who want to, to chime in, do you see that this is, um, uh, that, that this trend uh, is, uh, that we're on the right track effectively with the way NASA has been working or do, does NASA need to change again the, the, the mode of collaboration? So well, are we just build, building out or, or is it something new that we need? I, I can tell you sort of my the industry perspective and I'd love to sort of hear sort of what Je, you know, Jen has to say from the SDNB side and Empire also maybe from the, from the JPL side, but at least from the industry side, I can tell you that um, for, for some of the cases, we can point to some great successes. The, so the ISS uh, cargo and then crew delivery 
Uh, actually, I've been, I think, probably the, the, the singular great examples of this where you can point to, you know, something that, um, you know, was always hard and, and industry stepped up and, and, and did it. Um, we're, but we're, we're sort of, you know, we're seeing it um, in, in a few different places now as well with the ISS kind of follow ons and the free flyers. But we're also seeing it in, in sort of beyond just HEO, actually. So um, even NASA now is saying, why do I need to build more Tedruses? You know, um, the, the commercial communications industry is, you know, 10 or 100 X larger than NASA's. And so, uh, you know, folks like uh, SCAN or uh, CSP, I think is now what it's called, is actually now looking to do uh, uh, commercial uh, services for, for, for communication relay. So I think the, the place where it works really well is where you can, you can envision that industry can pull on R&D or products they've already developed for other cases, and then it can actually then bring them in and add leverage them for NASA, or places where you can envision that industry um, can come up with a commercial business case to do the same thing. Uh, uh, and, and, and so therefore you can have a joint partnership there. I think there's absolutely gonna be some things that is just, that there isn't going to be a commercial business case for. And so um, those perhaps would be, or things that have very large development budgets required, those may be less um, suited for, for these kinds of things. But Jen, I don't know, yeah. let, me, let me let me answer for you. Let me, let me throw it back to you. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that you said. Um, I think that from a NASA perspective, the shift in thinking to buying service from making everything in-house, so kind of the make-buy decision, and not just a buy decision, because oftentimes the structure of these, these uh, sometimes it's contracts, sometimes it's funded space act agreements or other transaction authorities, the, the service doesn't exist yet necessarily in full. So part of the purchase is to you're purchasing a service that will exist, right? But there's some development that may need to happen in order for it to get there. Um, that that kind of innovation and in how we think about the make buy decision um, is procurement is policy and procurement is economic development policy because how you choose to buy something uh, sets regardless of whether or not you know folks like to think it that way it does set some conditions on the market how you buy things right the terms and conditions and contracts set conditions on the market you know what data is expected to be shared with whom um, you know kind of what the bounds of the transaction are and so I think it's 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 a good thing that uh, when thinking about buying services and also in the, the type of the contract we use, whether it's a contract or funded space act agreements that might have slightly different terms and conditions than uh, traditional contracts or grants might, um, that it's that we're thinking about those, those things in the broader picture of the future uh, kind of uh, public private partnership ecosystem we wanna create. Um, and that's encouraging across not just kind of the HEO orgs, SOMD and ESDMD, uh, but as Patrick also indicated in science, the CLIPS, the commercial lunar um, uh, landers to deliver payloads is a whole nother surface that's our service that's being developed and led by SMD, Science Mission Directorate. In the Space Technology Mission Directorate, we have this program called the Flight Opportunities Program that's been around actually for quite some time. And it was kind of both a supply and a demand function for a while when the suborbital flight kind of capability was still emerging. Right. Um, when these folks that were developing suborbital capabilities were still trying to figure out how to do that market pairing, you know, pair with the demand for the, the supply for the actual capability with the demand for the services. And the flight opportunities program can kind of operate as that almost like market intermediary between supply and demand. Um, so that's like a different, also a different function than what um, Patrick talked about, where it may potentially also be useful to think about some of these kinds of. Um, uh, 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 service oriented ways of buying. But I think it's absolutely uh, been, um, uh, you know, a, a paradigm shift in the way that we think about make buy decisions um, at NASA. And you see that kind of thinking spreading um, to many different other areas, but we've got to do it in the right place. It's not a panacea, right? It's not always going to get you, that approach isn't always going to get you the results you want. Great. So uh, thank you very much. I think this was a very uh, informative and, uh, and, and enlightening hour of, of, cha of a chat uh, among us. Um, so this is all we have time for. I want to, to thank you once again for participating and, uh, and being with us today. 
uh, and thank you to the Sloan Club of New York for uh, putting together this excellent uh, opportunity for uh, uh, you know uh, hearing from you. So, Asha, back to you. George, Patrick, Jen, Barra, thank you so much. I thought the conversation was fantastic. We learned a ton that this is not just an engineer's game, but the business people and the, and the industry folks, you know, there's a lot of roles that people can play and a lot of opportunities for people to get involved. So I, again, thank you very much. Again, we'll send a recording. I'll send a recap of the meeting also with the links that Jen provided in the chat um, to SBIR and the solicitations. So people can find ways to get involved. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye, thank you. Goodbye from MIT. <laughs>